Well, welcome to today's talk, Tuesday the 5th of April. Now, I want to look at vitamin D again today because uh, the Secretary of Health in my country, in the UK, has come up with this idea. So Sajid Javid, uh, Department of Health and Social Care, have launched a call for evidence to improve vitamin D levels in the population, increase intake through dietary supplements and fortified foods and drinks. Now, we first advocated for this on this channel uh, in January or was it early February, certainly late January or early February 2020, both for the immunological benefits of vitamin D and the other wider health benefits of vitamin D. Because most of the time of the year, if you live in the United Kingdom or in the northern states or in Canada, you're just not getting enough from the sun. And even when the sun's out, we often don't get enough because we don't get enough body surface exposure. So, for example, if you are exposing all of one arm, uh, that's only uh, that's only nine percent. But if you are exposing only one forearm, that's only four and a half percent of body surface area. So you're not getting the opportunity to make as much. The front of a leg, for example, is nine percent, or the back of a leg is nine percent, or a torso at the front is eighteen percent. And of course, under a lot of social circumstances, you can't expose that sort of a that that amount of skin to the sun. So we we just don't make enough. And even in countries where there's a lot of sun, Australia, for example, where studies have been done that people are actually quite low in vitamin D because everyone's so worried about getting a melanoma. Uh, and, and rightly so, there is a risk there. But as a rough guide, about half the time it takes you to get sunburned. So if it takes you like an hour to get sunburned, in half an hour you'll make about 20,000 units a side if, if you've got some uh, reasonable amount of uh, skin exposure. So think about that. You know, it takes two hours to get sunburnt, and then in an hour you're probably going to make about 20,000 units. So naturally we're making large amounts. So that, that's, uh, this is what Mr. Javid has said here. And of course, um, we've thought of a way of doing this or mentioned this a long time ago. Uh, we did this, made this with Liz Gould uh, Infographics. Oh, probably, probably two years ago. Um, are you getting enough vitamin D? Uh, studies have found that uh, 70% of people have got suboptimal vitamin D levels. Now, how we measure this, um, of course, depends on where you set your criteria, which we'll, we'll look back at that in a minute. But uh, we thought of that. And of course, the darker the coloured people's skin, the more slowly they'll be making vitamin D. And this is really important because the only adaptive advantage to being light coloured, like me, is that when people migrated north from Africa in the Middle East, um, they were exposed to less sun, so they had to make their vitamin D more quickly. If you're out in the savannah and you're hunter-gatherer all day, then you're going to make your vitamin D really uh, quite quickly, even with very dark-coloured skin. But of course, the evolutionary advantage in becoming white is, is to make more vitamin D, and, and to some extent other things are made in the skin. But the vitamin D is the main thing. So my ancestors, of course, were, were dark coloured. All humans started off in, in Africa or the Middle East. So we have become white for this reason. This is how important this is. So we put forward this graphic um, a couple of years ago now. Um, so um, Sajid Javid again, um, uh, the importance for healthy bones, um, and teeth of course and uh, he actually specifically mentions Asian and black communities are more likely to have low levels so I am very refreshed to see the Secretary of State talking openly about this because in the past sadly political correctness has meant that a lot of people have been very low on vitamin D because we didn't want to highlight particular issues so delighted to see that Sajid Javid is is doing this uh, now and of course if he wants to come on the channel he's, uh, he's more than welcome and <clears throat> so we, here we have a, a nice um, nice sort of logo thing we want to improve vitamin d levels and that's good because you get some from the diet and you get some from the sun but actual fact you get very little little if, if you're in a natural inuit diet where you're eating a lot of fish and um, things like that um, well basically living on that you'll get vitamin d but most of us simply don't in this country we don't get enough vitamin D in our diet because it's associated with particular fatty foods. It's also associated with uh, offal, liver for example, but again we tend not to eat that in this country. So um, it's kind of out of fashion really, so a lot of us are short of it. Therefore the only way to get it is from the sun and of course a lot of the time we simply don't have the sun. Now here's one of Mr Javid's uh, retweets 
Office for Health Improvement and Disparities. Now, here is saying around one in six adults in the UK have uh, low vitamin D status. In actual fact, I believe it's much higher than that, because although the government haven't actually stated the level below which deficiency is is, is present, um, I think I think they've actually pitched it a bit low. So they've probably gone for the lower option there. Now, here we have the um, let's have a look at this uh, link here that the government have given, because we're all entitled to or allowed to make uh, give evidence here to give views. So open consultation, vitamin D call for evidence from the UK government. And uh, I, this may well be open to people from overseas as well. I think I'm not sure about that. Addressing health disparities related to accessing and uh, consuming vitamin D, improving population awareness, improving awareness amongst healthcare professionals about vitamin D, improving vitamin D status through diet, including fortified foods. So it looks like the Secretary of State is looking about adding vitamin D to more foods, which is interesting. And uh, I will be commenting on that when I, when I give my feedback. I'm not sure that's quite the way to go. Uh, improve, as he says there, improving vitamin D status through dietary supplements. So clearly realising that the vitamin D deficiency is present. Then you go down and uh, you can participate by clicking that. And then you go to the survey and then you can start the survey. And obviously I've, uh, I've already uh, started. And when you click next, the good thing about it is that it, it, it doesn't show I've started because I'm on a different computer. <laughs> but um, when you click next, it saves it so you can go back to it and you can do it uh, progressively as you as you have the time. So um, great to see the government are doing this public consultation. I think that's a really good idea. Now, um, so that, that's what they're doing. Current guidelines. Now, the current guidelines, check it out for the on the NHS site here. Um, it says October to March, not enough in the UK. So now where I live in the north, of course, there's even uh, there's even less. There's even less sun than in the in the uh, in the south of England. And uh, as you go into Scotland and more northern latitudes, you make even less. So really, I, I won't be making any vitamin D in Carlisle till April at the earliest. And even then, probably only in the middle of the day. And of course, in the middle of the day, half the time you're at work, so you can't you can't go out and get get some sun exposure. It's uh, it's often not simply practicable to do that. Uh, now, the government recommendation supplement is a uh, ten micrograms a day will be enough for most people. If you set the level in the blood as low as the government seem to have set it, that's true. I don't think they've set it uh, correctly. Um, now, uh, do not take more than a hundred micrograms, which is 4,000 units of vitamin D a day as it could be harmful. Well, I'm not sure there's much evidence for that, um, but that's the government guidelines. So actually, to let you into a secret, at the moment, I actually, I'm actually i actually taking 4,000 units a day, 100 micrograms. That's, that's what I take uh, personally. Um, vitamin D a day, at least throughout all the winter months. There's evidence of low vitamin D status in the community. So basically the government's saying here you can take up to 4,000 units a day. Now, the only problem really if you take too much vitamin, well, it depends on the individual. Some people are genetically prone to this. Is this why it's impossible to give blanket advice? So it always concerns me if people say take 4,000 units, take 5,000 units, take 6,000 units. I don't think you can really do that because everyone is going to respond differently. Ideally, everyone in the country would have their vitamin D status checked and the levels titrated accordingly but vitamin d i get mine from the supermarket and it's dirt cheap now it really is very cheap from the supermarket and you can buy up to 3000 international unit tablets from the supermarket that's seven seven uh, that's 75 micrograms and remember the government uh, put the upper limit there at 100 micrograms which is 4000 international units but the only real risk that is going to happen, at least unless you're taking more than 10,000 units a day, is that it's going to increase your calcium because vitamin D increases free calcium. But only at higher doses and only at, at, at those kind of doses, or even up to 10,000 units a day, only in genetically susceptible individuals. But the thing to do, because you're taking up free calcium, is these two go together. The vitamin D and the vitamin K2 go together. 
So if the vitamin D does release some calcium into the blood, and at 4,000 units a day it probably won't, but if it does release calcium into the blood, then the, that releases calcium into the blood, then the K2, what the K2 does, is it directs the calcium into the right places. So calcium, of course, is, is good. Calcium is essential, but you want calcium in your bones. So if you get a lot of vitamin, if you get a lot of calcium released into your blood, some of that can go into the tissues. And for example, the calcium can go into the walls of the arteries. And because the calcium's hard, it can reduce the flexibility of the arteries. It can reduce the degree to which they uh, normally pulsate, which you don't want. And this is a common recognised problem in medicine, calcified arteries, cal calcified heart valves, calcified other tissues. So you don't want that. So what the vitamin K2 does is it takes the calcium and it takes it from the tissues and puts it into the bones, which is exactly where you want it. So it's good for osteoporosis as well. So the vitamin K2 go together. Now, you may well ask, why is it? Because normally when we think about human health, we normally say that you get all the nutrients you require from a healthy diet. And, and that's true. But vitamin D, we don't get enough of because we don't get enough sun. Pure and simple, it's not from the diet. So that makes perfect sense. But what about vitamin K2? Well, vitamin K2 is different from vitamin K1. Vitamin K1 you get in things like leafy vegetables. Vitamin K2 is different. Vitamin K2 comes from bacterial fermentation. So, for example, our, our, our ancestors, um, actually in Europe, a lot of us are descended from uh, pastoralists. Um, so a group called the Beaker people that migrated into, uh, into my country, for example, about 6,000 uh, about 4,000 years ago. Yeah, about about, about 4,000 years, no, six, anyway, a few thousand years ago. <laughs> 4,000 BC, I think it was. This time, it was obviously a process. Anyway, these people migrated in and they lived a lot on uh, milk and cheese and, and, and meat, no, beef. They were pastoralists. But of course, the, the, uh, the cows, the cows that they were feeding from were eating grass and the grass would go into the gut of the cow and then there'd be bacterial decomposition of the, of the grass. And it's the bacterial decomposition that causes the production of the vitamin K2. And that will go into the milk and the cheese and the meat. Whereas a lot of uh, animal uh, husbandry these days is not grass fed. It's fed on soya beans and other, other unnatural things. So we're not getting the bacterial fermentation from grass fed animals as we did when we were hunter gatherers and when we were pastoralists. And the other place that vitamin K2 comes from is fermented foods. So um, typically, um, if fermentation occurs when you have a food such as a vegetable, such as cabbage, if you want to make sauerkraut or various vegetables, if you want to make kimchi and you add, you add a salty solution to that and you keep the air out and then it ferments over a few days. And that kind of makes sense as well, because for thousands of years, our ancestors will have been preserving food. And of course, how do you preserve food? You preserve it with salt. That's going to lead to some fermentation and then we'll get vitamin K2 produced. But personally, in my diet, uh, in my natural diet, uh, the way I was brought up, we don't have fermented foods. Now, if you live in um, Korea, South Korea, or you live in Japan or, or somewhere like that, fermented foods are part of your daily diet. Um, so so um, that, that's a really healthy diet, but we don't have that. So that's why it's worth considering foods with K2 in it or considering a, 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 a vitamin K2 supplement. And if you're taking about 4,000 international units of vitamin D a day, um, the sort of range you should be thinking about for vitamin K2, what I take personally, is I take about six or 700 micrograms a week, which is 100 micrograms a day. So that, I'm not telling you what to take, that's what I take, that's, that's a rough guide. Ideally, we'd all go and see doctors and nutritionists who would prescribe this uh, precisely for us. But there's a guide, that, that's what I'm taking at the moment, uh, averaging out at about 100 micrograms of uh, K2 a day and 400 micrograms, uh, 400, um, 100, sorry, 100 micrograms of, let me get that right, 100 micrograms of vitamin K2 a day. Right. 4,000 units of uh, vitamin D a day is 100 micrograms of vitamin D. So it works out about the same. It's about 100 micrograms of each per day. As we see here, 4,000 units is 100 micrograms. And plus 100 micrograms, I'm taking 100, about 100 micrograms, that's MCG of K2 a day. Now that's what I take, Not can't tell you what to take, can't prescribe. But that's 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 what I take, uh, averaged out over the, over the week.
because the two go together. And it makes perfect sense from a human history point of view that we, in the Western diet, where we don't eat fermented foods, that these are the things we are short of. So uh, this is the uh, National Diet and uh, Nutrition Survey. Uh, and again, there is evidence of low vitamin D status. That that's low plasma 25 hydroxy vitamin D concentrations in the blood. That's how it's measured. And this was found in the UK in all age groups. Now, as we've said, Sajid Javid said it's about one in six. And I think this is where he's getting his information from, from this survey. And uh, I've got the link above. So um, he's saying adults 19 to 64, about 16 percent are deficient. But as we've said, we put it much higher because we'd set the bar higher for, for vitamin D. But there's debate about that. Uh, over 65s, 13% uh, deficient, age uh, 11 to 18, uh, 18, 19% of the population are deficient. And he doesn't think many children are deficient. Or, or the, the, the survey doesn't think that children are uh, very often deficient. Again, um, not too sure about that. It depends where you set the... Um, where you set the criteria. I think the reason a lot of children are not deficient uh, or, or less, or, or that the children are less likely to have uh, low levels than adults is that a lot of uh, infant formulas contain uh, vitamin D uh, supplements. Mean vitamin D intake from food sources were, were below the reference nutrient intake of 10 micrograms per day in all age groups. So again, just reinforcing the idea that we need to get this from the sun but, uh, but very often we're not exposed to enough sun. So there you go. Um, now, I was going to go on and talk about um, a couple of vitamin D studies, but I've, I've gone on a bit longer than I meant to on that, so I think we'll leave that there. So um, I'm taking 100 micrograms of vitamin D a day. That's 4,000 international units. Very confusing that we've got two ways of doing it. And I, t I take about, about 100 micrograms of vitamin K2 a day on average as well. Ideally, uh, you would go to the doctor, get your levels checked and get it titrated to be correct. But I, I've asked my GP, the, the, every every time I've got my blood taken for the past few years, I've said, you can't do vitamin D as well, can you? And uh, the, 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 the nurse taking my blood's always said, oh, no, we don't do that. It's too, ex too Sometimes they're honest and say it's too expensive because I think it goes on the GP's budget somehow. But it's a real pity that we don't do it because it's a major health intervention but delighted to see that our secretary of state for health has, has taken this up so um glad mr javid has taken that up um pity previous um uh, health secretaries uh whose names i can't remember now uh we won't talk about said vitamin d was no good um pity about the wasted time but glad to see that uh we're now catching up now i'm gonna do i won't do it now but i've got there's a big study on vitamin D just from St Mary's St Bartholomew's Hospital that appears to show no benefit. So I want to talk about that in the context of a study from Israel, but we'll do that as another video, otherwise you'll get bored. So for now, thank you for watching.